So I'm going to ask uh, Dr. John White to come up, who's going to talk about an overview of the translational pipeline. Uh, Dr. Uh, White, who has MD and PhD degrees, was a pillar of our uh, committee. He's also the founding director of the Moss Rehabilitation Institute, a really distinguished center of research, and also brings to the table not only um, his extensive research uh, in the area of TBI, but also his experience in training, education, and clinical care of those who have uh, brain injuries and spinal cord injuries. John. Thank you, Ira. Um, so I, I think I share, I think the whole committee shares the concerns that have been expressed today, and I think it's fair to say from Barbara's slide with the absence of three pluses that if we were to simply say, do we have evidence that we have treatments that have durable, big time effects that we're really confident of, we would say no. Um, I think there are lots of reasons why we are at that place. I'd be happy to talk about them because it's a complex matter. But I guess the, the thing that I'm going to be talking about today is that I view, and I think most of us view, this as a maturational process from early studies that develop signal, as Barbara's referred to it, to studies that increasingly solidify and make more practical and ultimately cost effective um, these interventions. Um, so I think when we see one plus or two plus, that doesn't mean this is a lame intervention. It means it's an intervention that's at an early point in a maturational process. And one thing we could do is try to help it mature. So the things that I'm going to talk about briefly are the fact that I view clinical research as a developmental process, how that translational pipeline that's been referred to uh, throughout medicine uh, sort of applies to this domain and what the places for translational failure are. Um, I think that the types of designs that we need to move things along change as the maturation of the treatment changes. So it's not good to just say, oh, everything should be a big RCT. Everything that's a relatively late stage thing maybe should be, but not everything. Um, uh, Marb has already alluded to the fact that CRT can be delivered in a focused way around specific cognitive impairments or in a more holistic, multi-ingredient, programmatic way, which we refer to as comprehensive. And that has really different implications for research techniques and, and design. Um, and also, as Barbara alluded, the, the fact that interventions may seek to restore underlying cognitive function or to compensate for it. And again, that will have implications for what the appropriate outcome measures are and research designs. And I'm also going to introduce you to uh, a, a distinction between what we refer to as treatment theory and enablement theory, which I think are extremely important in shaping what realistic expectations are of a given form of cognitive rehabilitation therapy and therefore what appropriate outcome measures for its efficacy and effectiveness would be. Now, you're all familiar probably with the pharmaceutical model, which pro uh, progresses through these phases of development. I, I sort of added a phase zero, which is you had to get the idea from somewhere. And that idea can come from uh, animal models, from designer drugs, uh, from a, a number of areas. But then we pr proceed through these relatively rigid uh, series of steps that have different sample sizes, different typical research designs, and are designed to answer different problems in this maturational process. Um, the same goes, uh, well, what's the rationale for this? Part of it is that drug development is both expensive and risky. So you don't want to spend zillions of dollars on a phase three clinical trial when you have no idea whether it's likely to work or not and when it might hurt people. Um, so uh, the issue is that in cognitive rehabilitation research, we have those same issues that need to get addressed, but I think that they're not as linear and sequential because there are more complexities here. So we, we still have to have an idea, and now that idea comes from a much broader uh, set of areas. So there may be ideas that come from basic neuroscience, from other patient populations, but also from engineering and uh, compensatory uh, strategies and devices may have different origins and so on. Uh, now we have safety and dose finding, but dose-related toxicity is less likely to be the limiting factor for us. Uh, and so, in a sense, doses are uh, best regulated according to what delivers impact. But unless you have a design that detects impact, 
how do you figure out what the dose is? So we end up perhaps at an earlier point having to do comparative studies that begin to look like efficacy when we aren't really completely sure yet of the dosing. Uh, we want a proof of principle. So we want to know that this treatment seems to be doing the kind of thing that it was designed to do. Uh, and with respect to the object of treatment, which I'm going to define shortly. Uh, then once we get the sense that the treatment seems to be doing what it's supposed to be doing in our skilled hands, in our controlled conditions, it'd be nice to know that other people can do it too. It doesn't have to be me doing it in order to get that effect. And so we want to broaden it out to a larger group of practitioners and a larger group of patients, but I would argue still for the same treatment outcome. Still does it do the specific thing it's intended to do. But ultimately, we have to face the bigger question, which is, does it make any practical difference in the patient's life? So I could potentially improve someone's memory, but that may not send them back to work. That may not give them a spouse. That may not give them social integration for reasons that we'll get to. And if those are things we want to achieve, then we have to ask additional and complicated questions. Um, now, translational research has been defined as translating the findings of basic research into medical practice and thus meaningful health outcomes. But there's a lot of phrases uh, captured there. Basic research, first of all, in, in my definition, that doesn't just mean cellular, but it means basic cognitive science as well on how to apply that to treatment. What's medical practice? Well, in this domain, we're talking about both assessments of cognitive status and also the treatments actually used. And then meaningful health outcomes, of course, is a very complicated question, uh, probably throughout medicine, but certainly here, because what matters and is meaningful to the person with the impairment may be different from caregivers and social support networks, may be different from payers and uh, policymakers. So we may have to address impact from a number of perspectives. Now, there are obstacles to translation, and these have been widely described. I've sort of adapted these to this domain, but basically I would argue that we have, we have some idea generation. It's also good to know the natural history of the condition, because if somebody is going to recover their cognitive function over the next four to six weeks with no specific treatment, do I want to be investing a huge uh, uh, set of resources into speeding that up by a couple of days? Maybe, maybe I won't. Uh, I'm, oops, uh, sorry. I, I then get to this early human testing where I'm trying to assess safety and, and proof of principle. This gets larger, but it's probably going to be iterative because if I don't get a big enough effect, then I may redesign the treatment and cycle around here. Um, so one place where things can fail is when I adapt to human use. So I have animal studies. I try to adapt them to humans, and it doesn't seem to work. It's not feasible. Patients won't do it whatever it might be. Uh, and that's true in, in all areas of, of uh, translational research. Once I get really powerful evidence of efficacy, and then I want to get it into the hands of clinicians, uh, get them to actually use it, uh, there's another obstacle here which has much more to do with social behavior change. What makes practitioners decide to do something different next year than they did last year? That's not a, uh, not a property of the treatment, per se. It's a property of behavior change of clinicians. Um, and then we have, I would argue, an additional obstacle that's it's fairly specific to rehabilitation, which is that we may have very effectively treated a specific impairment like memory or attention. We want to achieve something bigger than that. And so we have this question of even does this effective treatment have any practical utility? Does it matter to anyone or who does it matter to? Now I want to just uh, uh, step back and talk about these two domains of theory, treatment theory and enablement theory, which I found extremely helpful in unpacking this area. Um, so if you're familiar with the ICF, the International Classification of Functioning and Disability of and health, it separates function to a lot of different levels. Um, and so there are sort of tissue levels and f organ function levels and personal activity levels and then social integration levels. Uh, they, they're, um, they're different levels of analysis and they have different uh, attributes. Um, 
treatment theory specifies the mechanism by which a proposed treatment changes its immediate treatment target. And we've uh, introduced the specific word for that as the object of treatment, to mean the thing that this treatment is capable of directly changing. Uh, and in doing so, this treatment theory defines the essential ingredients. What does that treatment have to have for you to predict that it will make that change in that treatment object? And so essentially, we have a model, which I, I bet Marcel's going to allude to as well, that has essential ingredients through a mechanism of action changing a treatment object. And that's, in a nutshell, what we refer to as the treatment theory. Now, there may be additional active ingredients that moderate the treatment's effect, but these essential ingredients, arguably, are the definition of that treatment versus some other treatment. In rehabilitation, treatment theories come from all over the place. We have ones that come from physiology, ones that come from social theory, uh, ones that come from bioengineering, and so on. So we have a much more heterogeneous set of relevant theories to bring to bear. So just to give you an example uh, of some familiar treatments, if we were talking about a familiar treatment like progressive resistance exercises, we would say that the object of that was to increase muscle strength or torque, uh, and that in order to do that, you have to have repetitive contraction and an increasing load. If you, don't if you don't do it over and over, and if you never change the weight, you won't get stronger and stronger. Um, uh, I'm going to skip to ones that I don't have to uh, spend a lot of time defining. So serial casting, we would say, let's say, is the length of the soft tissues around a joint. That's our immediate treatment object. And some form of prolonged tension is required. Now notice that what this does for me is say, well, I don't know if I really want to define treatment as a cast, a splint, a weight on your arm. I'm going to argue that, at least roughly speaking, however you deliver prolonged stretch is the same treatment, because I've said my treatment theory defines that treatment with respect to that ingredient. Um, uh, so we can have these additional active ingredients, often sort of motivational or feedback things that can affect a lot of different treatments, but they don't define a specific treatment. Now let's switch and talk about enablement theory. This addresses the causal interrelationships among variables at different levels in the ICF. So it asks, if we improve a particular impairment, what effects will that have elsewhere in this system of human functioning? And for these distal clinical effects, we use a broader term, treatment target. These are the clinically important treatment outcomes, and they're often distal to the thing that I'm directly impacting with my treatment. Um, so let's say that I have a memory remediation technique that's quite effective for changing memory. If I ask, does it affect school performance, this is not a treatment that affects school performance. It only affects school performance if memory is the limiting factor in school performance, OK? So it's a distal link. And we can imagine this is a highly schematic uh, version of, of an enablement diagram where we have sources of pathology, i.e. in the body structure, that impinge on uh, capacities of organs and organ systems which affect the performance of activities which ultimately affect big picture role functioning and so on. And the main point here is that there are lots of arrows and very few boxes are connected by a single arrow, which means that when you want to make a claim that, oh, I'm going to treat working memory and send people back to driving, that's going to be a simplistic prediction because one of your people who has a working memory problem also has a visual impairment and it's probably not going to be very good for them to go back to driving just because you fixed their memory. Um, so uh, enablement theory is essentially a specification of where those arrows are and some notion of the weights on them, i.e. some things have more important influences downstream than others. Um, and as I mentioned, generally there are multi, multiple relationships. Uh, and therefore, changing a single variable at a lower level is not, doesn't result in straightforward predictions at the higher level. Now, I think it's uh, inconceivable that we will build a whole model of every aspect of human function that has all the arrows and the weights plugged in. But I think conceptually, it's still a helpful way of thinking and that we can build local enablement models around skill domains such as uh, moving around in the community, 
um, uh, communicating with others, things like that. Now, just again, to give you an example, that we, we could take a very big picture variable, such a uh, outcome, such as employment as a long distance truck driver. It's going to depend on a, a lot of uh, underlying capacities like driving, map reading, blah, blah, blah. But we can break those down further and say they need reaching and grasping, visual discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. So there's this kind of cascading uh, layers of complexity that we have to deal with. But what do these theories buy us? Treatment theory gives us tools for changing things. How do we make a change? We have a theory about if you want to change this, here's the ingredients you need and here's how you do it. But it doesn't say anything about what the distal impact of those changes will be. It does, however, constrain the definition of the treatment. It's the thing that has those essential ingredients. It tells us things about the kinds of patients who might respond to that treatment. Uh, so a person who has a, a bony fusion at their joint probably won't respond to prolonged tension on soft tissues because soft tissues aren't the limiting factor and so on. Uh, and it helps us select outcome measures because if my treatment is, is only capable of improving your memory, I probably don't at this moment in time want to use school performance as my best outcome measure for moving forward, although I'll come back to that. In contrast, enablement theory predicts what will happen elsewhere in the ICF framework if we successfully change something, but it provides no tools for change. And moreover, it doesn't care how change is made. So if I can strengthen a muscle with exercises, with injection of trophic factors, with a prosthetic additional muscle, doesn't matter for the prediction on ambulation or stair climbing or whatever. Uh, the, the, it only has an input in uh, what the level of strength now is. Um, so, but it is going to constrain subject selection for effectiveness research. So we're not, if we're going to ask effectiveness questions like school performance, we're going to want to pick people for whom memory is a primary limiting factor, or we're going to want to make sure we give memory remediation and this and this and this to our students who have multiple impairments. But it's going to be kind of ridiculous to predict that giving that focused impairment should have big effectiveness impact distally if we don't think about it more carefully than that. Um, so just to put that in a more specific context, if we, if we have a treatment that we're studying here, uh, notice that I've said this treatment has, th this variable, whatever it is, has a pretty weak relationship to walking, pretty strong relationship to reading. So when I'm starting to trace the impact of, of having a tre effective treatment on this impairment, tracing it in this direction is going to be more fruitful initially than tracing it in this direction. If I want to trace it all the way up to some higher level, then I better think about do I also have treatments for some of these other things that are limiting that I can put together in a package which will then make it more realistic to ask about impact at these higher, more complex levels. So let's just look at that briefly in terms of its implications for the maturation of research. Uh, and before I do that, I want to just take a pause and r talk about placebos here. Because placebos in pharmaceutical research are very handy. They control for everything. Um, because you know what the active ingredient is. It is a molecule. And if you don't have that molecule, you got a placebo. But a true placebo is next to impossible in most cognitive rehabilitation research. Because it, the definition of a placebo is fully plausible but guaranteed to be inert. And since many of the things we're treating involve strategies, involve performance of meaningful tasks, patients can generally tell if you're talking about memory or you're talking about something irrelevant and they're concerned about memory. It's going to be very hard to mask that. Um, so we have to decide at each stage of research what confounds we're really most worried about and control for them in specific ways as opposed to having some magical placebo that controls for everything without any careful thought. So we may, in some studies, particularly early, we're going to be most concerned about controlling for natural recovery. Some kinds of self-assessment or subjective outcomes, we're going to be most concerned about the bias of the patient and clinician. Um, some 
uh, that involve uh, performance outcome measures, just doing the outcome measure over and over gives you improvement. And so we need to control for that. But the issue is that we have to say, what am I worried about and how can I design a control for that as opposed to this blanket strategy of the placebo. OK, so I'm just going to take you through three imaginary stages on early stage. So we're, here we're trying to have proof of concept. I have a treatment theory. I want to get some support that the ingredients act on the object in the way that I thought they did. Um, sometimes we can assess safety at this point. Sometimes we can't. Depends on the nature of that intervention and how obvious the risks would be. But at this stage, we really rely exclusively on treatment theory. We're not ready to ask about practical benefit from this treatment. We just want to show that it does the thing that we predicted it should do. And so our best outcome measure is going to be a measure of that thing itself, even if it's not clinically important by itself. Because one thing we need to do is optimize that treatment. We need to optimize how it's delivered, how it can be most powerful, what the right dose is, and the best outcome for helping us judge those things is the most proximal outcome that is most tightly related to that treatment. So at this early stage, in terms of participants, we would think about what kinds of patients are likely to demonstrate the most powerful and measurable impact on that object. Uh, we want to develop and modify the treatment protocol and move it toward a manual so that some of the problems we talked about before can be addressed. Uh, we need to consider, do we already need a comparison treatment? If I'm doing this study in a relatively acute period, probably even at this early period, to figure out whether the treatment's doing anything, I already need a control group. I might not in the chronic stage at this early phase. Um, so again, the most sensitive and direct measures are measures of the object of treatment itself. And then in terms of optimal design, we might need to think about natural history. Where are we in the spontaneous recovery spectrum? And also, how visible are the treatment ingredients? And therefore, how much blinding is realistic? Or how am I going to handle bias if it's not? And so on. Is it feasible to randomize? There are a lot of issues that come to play. Now, if we move a little farther down and we say, you know, I have a thing that seems to work the way it looks, the, the way I predicted it would work, uh, but I've only studied it on a few people and I've only delivered it myself. So now we want to get to efficacy and maybe early effectiveness. We're still mostly in the domain of treatment theory. We, we still want to say, is it effective in doing the thing it's supposed to do for lots of people, delivered by lots of people? Now here, we clearly need the treatment to be more formalized. We're going to give it to a bunch of practitioners to deliver. What are we giving them, and how do we train them? We need manuals and training algorithms and so on and so forth. We want to now still see that it affects the object in a broader sample of patients and facilities, further explore safety, and maybe develop early evidence of impact on clinically important outcomes in selected populations. So maybe. I'm now beginning to look at school performance, but I'm picking people who say memory is the biggest problem I have at school, not all comers. Okay. Uh, and so here, kinds of patients likely to benefit res with respect to the treatment object and with respect to some relatively proximal clinical outcomes. Uh, appropriate comparison treatments at this point. Ha do I need to adjust my dosage or tweak my manual? And now I begin probably to include some proximal distal outcome measures, i.e., some things that venture out into practical world, real world benefit but are not yet, did they go back to work and pay taxes, which is probably still a little gross. And in the late stages, we're dealing more with effectiveness, still safety potentially, in routine application. But I think in rehabilitation, we need to think of two subversions of effectiveness. So the top one is the traditional effectiveness. If I now give this to practitioners who don't have special training in health centers that aren't academic, blah, 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 do I still get the effect? But the effect is still on the treatment object. In other words, does serial casting only work when I do it, or does it work when everyone does it? But I'm still measuring range of motion to answer that question. 
But there's another form of effectiveness that is more rehabilitation specific, which is this effectiveness on distal clinical outcomes. And this re relies mainly on enablement theory. So we're not going to solve this problem by making the treatment stronger. We're going to solve this problem by asking, in whom can this treatment alone deliver big clinical benefit? And in whom can this treatment, in combination with X, Y, and Z other treatments, deliver big time clinical benefit? And so uh, what kinds of patients are likely to routinely receive this treatment and what kind of facilities are likely to routinely deliver it? Uh, are there characteristics of both patients and facilities that might moderate how effective it is that we should be measuring? Um, now for the treatment, when we do a comparison, it may be more relevant to compare to standard of care or to what's currently out there rather than some highly theoretically uh, driven comparison. Um, and now we're going to add, in addition to still measuring the object of treatment, we're going to add more outcome measures that are related, closely related targets. And we're going to need designs that look at overall effectiveness at whatever level of distal impact we think is realistic to expect. Um, and in terms of those distal outcomes, what kinds of patient, as I said, can experience broad impact from this treatment alone and broad impact from a package of treatment that includes this treatment. And if it's a package, then I'm going to need algorithms for how to decide whether each individual patient gets this treatment or they get some of the others but they don't need this one and so on. Um, uh, and then, of course, as I mentioned, we have measures of distal outcomes that are plausible given the realities of the patients and the treatment. Um, and at this point, it may be increasingly difficult to do RCTs. We may need to rely more heavily on health services research. And you know, as the military health system considers introducing things, one thing they could consider is introducing them systematically and in staggered fashion such that we get naturalistic evidence of the impact of those introductions. Now, just finally, a disclaimer. Not all treatment research follows this methodical sequence. Everyone doesn't consult me before they start doing their program of research, <laughs> though I wish they did. Um, some treatments are in wide use without much of a theoretical foundation. Somebody just said, let's see if this works. It seems to work. Um, some treatment packages are in wide use, but we don't know very much about which specific ingredients are most important and for whom. And some treatments. Uh, are effective at the group level, but undoubtedly differ in their effectiveness for individual people, and that's the issue of these moderating variables that we don't understand very much about. Nevertheless, I would argue that whether a treatment moves linearly through the sequence or not, having this sequence in mind and asking yourself, where, where does this treatment live right now? what are the things that need to get answered to move it forward is still a very useful frame of reference. So I would argue that CRT uh, uh, being rigorously shown to be effective will require multiple studies, not one, that the goals of those studies do and should differ as things move along, uh, and that thinking in terms of treatment theory and enablement theory in combination will help guide study design so that we don't ask unrealistic things of treatments, and yet we are most uh, likely to capture the treatment benefits when they exist. Thank you.